Pensacola Revival has been called the most significant move of God in North American history. Millions of people from all over the world have come to experience the power of God at Brownsville. There is an excitement among the people who come night after night, hungry for more of God. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across this land. He has fire in his eyes, a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse all across his land. And he's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? a crown on his head, he carries a scepter in his hand, and he's leading the armies all across this land, he's calling out to you and me, will you ride with me, will you ride with me, we say yes Lord.
As a result of the revival, the youth group at Brownsville has been radically changed. In fact, many feel that they played a major role in bringing about this mighty outpouring. Before the revival, uh, it was the typical youth group, um, just, you know, almost a club feel. They all just come, come together, wasn't real hungry, wasn't real serious about the Lord. And in fact, I, I remember I'd just be pulling my brain, you know, hair out. I Because I'd go in there, I'd preach like a madman, and they'd just sit there like stoned Indians, you know. And I'd go home and resign on Wednesday night and repent, come back to church on Thursday and go back to work. And just it was a um, but as far you know they weren't like they are now they just they were just there just kind of there uh, the raised in church heard it all done it all done the church camp things done the ski trip things you know and just kind of coexisting so to speak now remember we loaded up about 36 kids about four o'clock in the afternoon and did the traditional prayer you know Oh, God, give us a good trip, keep us safe, you know, that type of thing. Amen. And uh, we don't even get outside of Pensacola city limits. One of, one, of the, one of the teenagers pipes up and he said, Hey, guys, let's pray. Well, one of the things that I've learned through the years in youth ministry is when my teenagers initiate something, I need to just keep my hands off of it, you know, just let them go with it. And they pray all the way back to Pensacola, prayed all the way to the Mobile concert, we're, they're on the way back. It's 2 o'clock now on Sunday morning. Now, they, they started Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock, nonstop. The only time they hadn't been praying is when I made them go to church services. It's now 2 o'clock Sunday morning. And I remember we were about halfway back here from, uh, from Mobile. It's about an hour drive, and it's pitch black. Pitch black, nothing but darkness. And I remember we were about halfway back in, that, in the middle of that darkness, and and it got dead quiet in the van. First time I saw, heard it get quiet since we left Friday afternoon. And I remember leaning over, looking over my wife and I said, I think they finally ran out of gas. And I just knew they were exhausted. And I'll never forget Melody. I remember I turned on the dome light and I looked in the rearview mirror and there were still about four or five kids sitting there with their hands lifted, tears streaming down their face and they're just praying quietly in the darkness. And at that moment, I was scareder than I've ever been before in my life because I knew that I knew that I knew that something was about to happen. And I remember laying in my bed that night and telling my wife, I said, sweetheart, I said, God's always been good to us. I said, but I was always one of those youth pastors that knew where I was and where I was going. And I said, but I feel like that there's something big about to happen and I don't know what to do. And it was just a couple of weeks later that Father's Day came. When the revival hit, it, 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 it was not only an immediate spillover into the youth group, I believe that the youth group really was a big spearhead of that. Um, as I said uh, earlier, you know, we were talking about the moving of the Holy Spirit. We were talking about this is the time. We knew that. And so the young people, uh, they were already primed. They were ready. So when the power of God hit, they were, boom, they were in there. In fact, if you, if you look back over the history of revival, uh, many of the ma major key factors of revival were young people. You've got Charity, who's been singing every night practically from day one. You've got uh, Elizabeth and Allison Ward, you know, who were uh, very instrumental parts in the very beginning of it. You have uh, the, the sweeping of the schools. Uh, we went from three campus clubs before revival to now over 30 campus clubs, you know, and where they're effectively reaching, you know, their schools and so forth. So the young people were... were you, when you go outside of Brownsville, you don't hear very much about the young people, but the young people were very much a strong part and still are uh, a foundation in spearheading of the revival. It's like every other revival through church history. It's always been through the younger generation that I think is not so set. You know, in their ways, they're more open for new things, that type of thing. And, and even though our whole church was ready, our young people is definitely a large part of that. God has come down uh, in, in our youth services uh, in a tremendous way. And uh, Richard Crisco, our youth pastor, um, has been tremendously used by God and is being tremendously used by God. The, um, the youth group uh, now has, has penetrated our schools with uh, fire. 
and with the, the fire of revival in their hearts and they're actively witnessing in the schools and uh, we have Bible clubs I think in, in all 30 of the schools in, in Escambia County now. The power of God would fall in our youth services uh, every week. I mean, you know, the, the praise and worship was totally transformed. Um, you know, whereas before, you know, it was almost, you know, it was just that, a song service. Now you have teenagers that just exploded out of the pew. You couldn't keep them in the pew. They were exploding out of their chairs so that they could dance and rejoice before the Lord. And as they begin to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and in unity and in, with all their heart, the Spirit of the Lord would fall. And, uh, you know, it, it would be manifest in many different ways. I mean, sometimes you would have, literally, without even anybody laying hands on them, you would have, you know, crowds of teenagers begin to fall under the power of God and shake. And, and some of them would begin to experience trances, uh, visions, and, and um, and all, it, you'd see many times it'd be slain in the spirit. And this is not only church kids, we're talking about teenagers that had no church background whatsoever. There were teenagers that, you know, I refer to them as snots. There were teenagers, they were just snots. I mean, didn't love God. They didn't love one another. They didn't love anybody but themselves. And, and they would experience the power of God and they may shake or fall or some of them didn't do anything but their lives were totally transformed. And they loved God, the glory of the Lord is on them. You couldn't keep them out of church. They were there seven nights a week. It was just the most incredible thing I've ever experienced in my life. You know, so it's not just church teenagers who had been uh, uh, set up and who had been brainwashed. I mean, teenagers coming from out of gangs and out of drugs and out of bad situations coming there being totally transformed by the power of God in our services. Typically we'll, we'll open up with one to three songs just to kind of get the teenagers in, get their mindset, everything's starting here. Then I like to go ahead and get rid of an announcements, um, you know, uh, those type of things, all the evils that you have to have in youth ministry. <laughs> Take care of our announcements and then we go into praise and worship. And usually we have at least an hour of praise and worship. Sometimes Sometimes we'll have two or three hours of praise and worship, but we just, I, I release my worship team and I tell them, are your goal and your responsibility as a worship team is to bring us into the presence of the Lord. Anything less than that, you've blown it. And uh, I have nailed them before. For, you know, I said, we don't come here for good music. We don't come here for good sermons. We come here to meet God. That's our number one ambition and goal on Thursday night is to meet God. And, um, and then, uh, and, and, and then after that, I'll preach my heart out, you know, and like I said, I usually preach in series, I'll, I, and I usually preach for about an hour, and then we'll have a strong altar call. And, uh, and then we usually have prayer for teenagers at the end, kind of similar to this format that's across the street, but we will break away from it more than they will. Uh, but we pray with the teenagers at the end until everybody's been prayed for, and, and they will continue to worship the Lord. We have a second set of worship team members that come up at the end, and they lead us in worship for another hour, two, three hours, however long it takes. Uh, God's just raising up an army of young people that are invading the schools and the streets, and it's, it's magnificent to see what God's doing among the kids. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and He said, Richard, I've had a generation that has sought me because they were told that I'd put a pool in their backyard or give them a big car. He said, but I have a generation that's rising up that doesn't care about what I can give them or what I can do for them but they just want to know who I am. All over the world, thousands of people have seen the dramatic testimony of Elizabeth Ward on video. So he got me up there and I said, God, I can't go any farther than this. I'm, I can't lift, you know, I'm not going to go up off this ground. And, and I guess it came down to that I didn't have the faith in him to pick me up off the ground. But then he let, my, he let go of my hand and my hand began to shake just very, very fast, just up in the air. And then I, I just lost all my strength and I fell to the ground and I said, God, what are you doing? And he said, he told me that it was just like in my life, if, if I had faith, he could take me anywhere. But if I didn't have the faith, he would let, you know, if I couldn't hold on to him and he couldn't hold on to me, then my life would go like my hand was going and I would fall and, I, and I, that would be my life. You know, my life would be a disaster if I, if I didn't hold on to him. And so I understood that, 
And many things happen. Amy was um, extremely beautiful, extremely uh, intelligent, uh, very opinionated, very uh, bold, um, very hateful. She, she seemed to be loveless. She seemed to be uh, so distant. It was very difficult to communicate with her. She had her own opinions. She had her own um, intentions. She had, she had her own thoughts about the way she was going to live her life. She, if she didn't want to do something, it didn't matter. Wild horses couldn't force her to do it. Before the revival, I was, um, I grew up a very rebellious child. Um, I was like that from the time I was born. It wasn't something I picked up along the way and just became as I got older. It was something that I was from the moment I was born. The first time I met Amy Elizabeth Ward was at a bowling alley. I, uh, of course, I seen her in church and all that, but my first encounter with her was at a bowling alley. And it was funny, uh, I know the Lord set it up because He wanted me to see what she was really like. And now that I look back, I can see how God has brought her through and changed her. I'll never forget it, you know, she was uh, she's just bowling away, you know. And uh, she like broke her nail and she would just get so mad. And I just, I told my friends, my friends were bowling. I said, this girl is a brat, man. She is a brat. She's a pain. And uh, just the look on her face and she was just, aggravated the whole game and I was just like man what is her deal and uh, it was really really neat and I remember when she left I was just like man that girl is just out there she's lost it. she's a heathen before revival Elizabeth I can't even call her Elizabeth before revival I have to call her Amy because to me Amy and Elizabeth are two totally different people and a lot of times people come to the Lord and they say, you know, they say, yes, I'm different, and they are different, like even me. I was different, but I wasn't that different. I wasn't as different as she was. She's not, nothing like Amy was before at Bible. Amy was mean. She was hateful. She didn't care about anybody. All she wanted was what she wanted to make her happy at that moment and didn't care who she had to hurt to get it how mean she was to get it, what she had to do to make herself feel good. She was just eaten up with sin and meanness. Her whole life she was like that. She was mean as a little girl. And she just, she got more and more into the world, more and more into to sin. And before revival she was the worst she'd ever been. And in our home, my mom has always been a Christian. She's always pushed God and do things right because it's right and don't rebel, don't drink, don't smoke, don't hang out with people that do that, don't, you know, it was always just walk the straight and narrow and I hated that. I, from the depth of my being, I hated that. I hated do right. I loved do wrong. But she was so hard and so resistant. She had so much sin in her, so much uh, iniquity. It was so strong in her that it took it took a violent encounter with God. I, I call it, it was like a Saul of Tarsus experience with Amy. And so the first night I went, I don't remember any of the preaching, any of the altar call. I mean, I don't even know if he gave an altar call. But um, at the end of the service, Allison was like, come up to the altar with me. And I was like, I don't want to go to the altar. I'm just going to sit here until y'all are ready to go, and then we'll go home. And so I sat there for like probably an hour or so, a long time. Allison kept coming back. She'd go up to the altar and then she'd come back and say, please come with me. And I was like, I don't want to go. And whenever she came back and said, please go with me, I don't want to stand up there by myself. I felt sorry for her. Because I always kind of felt sorry for her. She was real timid and shy and I was more, okay, I'll go with you. You know, I don't want you to stand by yourself. So I went up there. So I stood up there for two and a half hours. I was very stubborn. <laughs> Gonna have my way. And, um, I waited for him. He kept passing by me and he'd like pray for everybody around me and then he'd look at me and smile and just keep right on going. And I was like, this guy's got an attitude. I mean, because I had an attitude and I thought everybody else had an attitude. And I thought, he doesn't want to pray for me. I must look like somebody he doesn't like or something, you know. That was the only reason why I could figure out he wouldn't pray for me. So I was like, well, fine, I'll just stand here and he's going to pray for me because if I'm the last person standing here and he doesn't pray for me, he's going to look bad, you know. And finally, it must have been around 11 o'clock at night. I don't remember the time that Steve came back by 
one of those times he had gone back and forth and he just barely said more Lord to her and she was thrown to the floor and was on the floor for three to four hours and so many things happened when she was on that floor. God was just physically and literally with, if you've ever seen God with someone, he was with her on that floor. But then when I saw her on that floor that day, it was just like, my gosh, this has to be God because I just saw this girl and uh, I know how she is. And to see her on the floor with the power of God sweeping through her life. And uh, it was just so neat to see her when she got up off the ground. She didn't have a clue what happened. And I was in awe. Matter of fact, I was there to like 5 or 5.30 in the morning. We saw the sun come up that morning. I was just in, I was in such awe of what God was doing in her life. It was a holy, hallowed moment. They said it looked like somebody hooked me up to a, an electric you know, plug because they said from my head to my feet would shake and it was like I was almost I was almost off the ground it would shake so hard but it didn't hurt and I I I can't say that I've ever really understood it but all I knew was that inside I was changed and inside as all that was going on God was healing me inside when Elizabeth came home shaking from the revival I wasn't scared there was nothing scary about it. I knew that it was God. I knew that what God was doing in her, I mean, I had seen her drunk. I had seen her pass out from alcohol. And I thought, she was looking for such a rush from alcohol. She was looking for such a rush from these parties and this music and, and this drug that she would put in her body. And that would make her pass out. That would make her fall down on the floor and just act like a fool and not even know who was going to bring her home, not even know how she was going to get home. I thought, just because she's shaking, if it's God, you know, she's been looking for something like this. That was the counterfeit. This is the real. And you just can't tell me that it wasn't God. I, I am a mother. I had three daughters. I've seen them go through hell. And I've seen God. I've seen him move upon their bodies. I've seen him change their hearts. I've seen him rebirth their spirits and renew their minds. And I've, I've just seen him. I haven't seen his body or his face, but I have literally seen him present with them. And I never saw a manifestation before that night, and I've never had a doubt that it was God. Never. I've never looked back, never turned back thinking that, well, maybe this isn't God. Maybe this is, you know, something weird. No. It's God. All I knew was that for the first time in my life, I felt, I felt life. And it wasn't something that I had to go drink to get. It wasn't a fulfillment that I had to get from alcohol or from boyfriends or from friends at school or from accomplishing things. It was something that was there. It wasn't, it was something that was more real than anything I had ever known. It was more real than my own body. It was, and at that point my whole life was changed because I thought, this is what I want. This feeling inside of me is what I want. And what it was, it was the love of God. It wasn't some preacher staring down my throat saying, you know, quit sinning, quit drinking, sit in church and be boring. It was the love of God. It was the life of God that entered my spirit. And I've never been the same. Along with Elizabeth Ward, her sister Allison Ward had a major impact on people from all over the world as they watched her testimony on videotape. I know that God loves people so much and he's, he's, he's in a hurry. He, he wants, he wants, he wants everyone. He, there's not much, not much more time. And he, he aches and he, he grieves for your spirit. He grieves for you. <laughs> Before revival, Allison was uh, just a wonderful daughter. She really was. She was lost, but she was a wonderful daughter. She was respectful. She was uh, 
very responsible in her life with her work and her, the goals that she had set for herself. As far as her relationship with me, she was uh, just marvelous. She was helpful, ca caring, and a really uh, a supportive daughter in the home. But she was very depressed with her own life, her own uh, social life, and her own uh, things that really were important to her. She didn't sit, feel like that she was making any progress. And she was successful in almost every area, but she was extremely unhappy. I was going downhill inside much quicker than I had. I was just so depressed. It was like I was getting more depressed every day. I was getting more unhappy every day. I was thinking, something has got to give here. Allison was moving deeper into the depression, just deeper into her unhappiness. And she was at, a, at such a low point when revival came that she knew that that was the answer. That night when she went to revival, uh, Steve preached the sermon, uh, take, a hold of hand, take a hold of the hand of the Lord and let go of the hand of the world. And Allison had had a hold of both of those hands. She had had God's, she was trying to hold on to God and trying to hold on to the hand of the world because she didn't see any, any life in God. She didn't see any life at church or any meaning or any power. The night that I went to revival and got saved, um, it, I believe it was a Sunday night, it was a week after Steve had first come, and it, the revival had been going on every night, and we had not gone to it because I didn't want to go, and um, I didn't know what to think about it, but again, Mom drug us there. I was there with her and my youngest sister, and we were sitting on the very back row, very back pew on the bottom floor, as far away as we could get without being in the balcony. And uh, that night when she sat on the pew right beside me, she never went to an altar call. She never raised her hand. She never moved toward God in a physical way. But she laid her soul down that night just in the pew when Steve preached that sermon. And she was transformed just sitting by me in the pew, never to be the same again. Because it, her heart was so at such a point that she was at the point of just giving up, giving up her life, her physical life, if, you know, because it would have been such a relief, she thought. Uh, but when she heard that sermon that night, she knew what she had to do, and she was totally willing to do it. And that was the point where the Lord saved her and transformed her whole life. After that, somehow I was able to get up out of the pew and go forward to get prayer. And it was like that was my my altar call. I had prayed and I was willing to walk down in front of all these people that I knew and get prayer from Steve who I wasn't even really sure of yet. I wasn't sure of revival and what was going on but I was, I was um, able to put all that aside and just say, God, you know, if this is you, this is what I want. I want you. And so I went down for prayer and um, Steve prayed for me and other whoever else was praying prayed for me and at the beginning I never even fell down I never fell out in the spirit I never shook or jittered or my hands didn't shake nothing happened but I knew that this was what I wanted I was going to go after it and nothing had to happen I just wanted God and I knew he was there and um, so I left that night I came home and it wasn't until the next morning I got up and I remember sitting in our kitchen and telling my mom I said, Mom, I got saved last night. And I didn't, I didn't even know until the next morning. <laughs> it was wonderful that the depression was gone. The unhappiness was gone. The fear was gone. Everything that had kept me so weighted down, it was gone. It was just in my heart, it was in my mind, and nothing happened to my body. But I was a new person. I had never been happier in my life. I would never been more peaceful and more settled to just, to just be with God. It, it was awesome. It was an awesome thing. God was just, he was just uh, performing a work in them, even from the beginning. Uh, for his plan, and he's, he's still performing that work in all of them. They're all ministers of the gospel, and it's the most blessing that any parent could ever ask for.
<laughs> Dr. Woolwine's my hero. <laughs> You know, you meet a lot of uh, people who's in public service positions um, who will talk one thing out one side of their mouth and they live another one, you know. And there are even principals in our schools that whenever I sit in their office and they go, oh, yes, Richard, you know, we're Christian, we want Christian influence, but we, you know, and they, and they tiptoe around and they, they're real petrified of getting people upset and mad. The Chip Woolwine is, uh, is one of the rarities out there. I just couldn't get to revival enough. That's all I wanted to do. I would, it, was, it was late summer, school was approaching, I was a vice principal at Niceville High School, and I just wanted to get to revival. And I would, I would go to revival at night, I'd work all day, go to revival at night, and, and then my wife would go. She would, so I would go a couple times and she would go. But when the Lord began to impact these kids, and you're living in the shadow, of this Brownsville revival where the world is coming, it's going to affect uh, your school. It's going to affect your grocery store. I mean, it's going to affect the community. It just, it just has to. Kids would come up and they'd want to go. They would hear about it. They would, they would see a, uh, a change in somebody or a kid that went to the revival would come back and tell them what happened to them at the revival. And so they would want to go. We had a Bible study at the club that met um, and this, this is all after, after Revival hit, after we really got involved. We had a Bible study club. It went up to like 50, 50 kids, 20 to 50 kids every Friday afternoon would, would be at Bible study club. Prayer around the flagpole. Every Friday morning before school there was prayer around the flagpole. There were, there were bunches of kids that were getting saved. I had a young man that walked in my office on a Friday afternoon, looked at me and said, and said, uh, Dr. Warren, I want to get saved. I didn't even know this boy, but he knew, he, he could see and he knew to come to me. He says, I want to get saved. And I said, um, well, you know, when you go home, <laughs> you know, um, you know, tell the Lord that you're a sinner and you want to give forgiveness for your sins and you repent. You want Jesus to be your Lord, Master, Savior, and very best friend. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, tell Jesus that. He says, no, I, I want to get saved right now. So I go, well, okay. <laughs> so this kid gets saved right there, right there with me, you know. It was life at Niceville High School. It was just nobody was going down the hallway saying, uh, you know, Billy, come here, whether you want to or not, we're praying for you. But it was just a natural thing. Kids were getting saved. They were doing things of the Lord. They were going to Bible study. They were going to revival. We had teachers coming up and asking me for prayer, which, which I certainly thought was legal. Uh, a teacher who had cancer, she came up and said, Dr. Wong, would you pray for me? I have cancer. And I said, of course. Uh, so, I, you know, Jesus healed her, you know. Um, and she's fine today. But the power of God was so strong at Niceville High School that I can remember being on duty in the hall and a student walking up to me and they said, they said, when I left, when I left home this morning, Dr. Warren, I was not manifesting, I was not shaking in, in any way. When my feet, when my feet entered this building this morning, that's when I started shaking. That's when I started manifesting. He, as, as m many know, began to bring bus loads and van loads from uh, Niceville High School where he was a uh, uh, vice principal at. And as a result, there were some parents that began to get concerned, you know, about this following and things that were happening to their teenagers. and the freedom that seemed to be happening in their church school and you know that their kids are coming home and hearing about kids talking about Jesus and 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 so uh, they begin to uh, bring accusation against Chip and want him to back off but he wouldn't back off I mean he just stood his ground and said I haven't done anything wrong I'm within the legal rights you know and uh, they're student initiated, student led. I'm just answering their questions, and and even when the heat came, he just stood his ground. One one example of what happened was there was a there was a student who had 
been involved in drugs, alcohol, premarital sex, uh, depressed. And she got saved. She got set free of all that. You know, first of all, she got saved. Jesus is her best friend. She's going to heaven. And her grades go up. Alcohol goes away. Depression, drugs. She's happy as can be. And in fact, she, there's a, a video of her. Her baptism is, is videotaped here. Well, here come her parents came up to, up to my office and, and, and uh, came in to me and stuck their finger in my face and they said, they said, Dr. Warren, do you know what our child is doing every time we go back in their, into their bedroom? And I said, uh, no, sir, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I've never been in your house. They said, well, they're reading their Bible and it's your fault. And suddenly you begin to realize that there are parents out there who would, no kidding, they would rather their, their child be on drugs, alcohol, premarital sex than going after the things of the Lord, than being back in their bedroom, reading the Bible. But do I have any regrets for anything that, that, that we said or did at nights for high school, for praying with kids, or inviting them to church, or reading the Bible with a child? Uh, certainly not. Certainly not. It's great to have men of God in, in positions like that who will make a stand. And, and they make making a difference. They're making a difference. And it's the end of the story is yet to be seen and shit worldwide.
Muhammad Cause Muhammad's been dead a long time We don't worship old Buddha I know he's just too ugly We don't worship our jobs We don't worship money We won't bow down to this world Political systems, our kings, our nations, our things, nothing but the Lord our God, nothing but the Lord, the creator of the universe, the Lord, the King, the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, Jehovah, Jehovah. Prior to revival uh, coming to Brownsville, Children's Church was probably a lot like children's ministries across the country. Um, much of our uh, ministry was uh, programmed, much of our ministry was game uh, type things, and much of our ministry was uh, more entertainment oriented. And sometimes we have a hard time On Father's Day of 1995, uh, we were all in Children's Church that morning. And uh, we did not know exactly what was taking place in the sanctuary. Uh, we were used to two, two and a half hour services at that time. <clears throat> and um, as the service lingered on to three hours and four hours, we knew something must be taking place in the sanctuary. The power of God fell in children's church and, and changed our children. Um, we began to have intercession in our children's ministry. And I am not an intercessor and don't understand intercession. But I do know that the children were doing something that God was moving upon their hearts to do. And we began to see children uh, reacting in very uh, different ways and their spiritual giftings began to come out. And I believe that's a result of uh, the fact that I began to react and flow in different ways. And I would have to say that the children will only go uh, as far as we ourselves as their leaders will go. And they are following our lead. And if we will not dance, they will not dance. If we will not uh, get excited about the things of God, they will not be excited about the things of God. And if we will not open our hearts to a revival, they will not open theirs either. The manifestations that occurred here during those first years uh, primarily were children bowing, moaning for lost souls, groaning for lost souls, those groanings. Um, uninhibited dance and, and praise, um, uninhibited worship, uh, children that began to realize that there was a freedom in the things of God. And they behave differently, they speak differently, uh, they love differently. Uh, their relationships with others are different as a result of God coming in His power. And I think that's the most important of manifestations is the change that this revival has brought to the children. Most of the things that are done in this building, in this room, on a Sunday morning service are done by the children. Uh, Jacob Green has preached to this service in its entirety before. Uh, the cameras are operated by young people here in the ministry. Uh, the camera, the, the video is directed by young people. The worship team is young people that have grown up in this ministry. The puppet team are 10, 11, and 12 year old children from this ministry. Uh, the ones that oversee and maintain discipline are, are 11 and 12 year olds from this ministry. So children that come in all of a sudden, many times for the first time, see God can use kids. And we for so long have spent time telling children that oh, when you get older 
And the neat thing about it is these children are coming in and seeing, he can use me. And when they leave here, they, they leave here with a, a new realization of what they can be in Christ. And we make sure that children know you can dance around and you can have a great time, but what you're doing here is you're showing everybody around you how much fun you're having in the Lord. After the Bible story uh, comes the time to uh, get a little more serious. And I will generally do an object lesson uh, that the Lord has given me during the week. I very seldom ever have to look for object lessons. Uh, we will do an object lesson that will lead to a time of worship. But when the Spirit of God moves, there's so much more. And when you have children that will worship God as much as two and a half hours, there's just not enough time anymore. And uh, if we at any time realize that the service is ending uh, before we get to that point, we will always conclude the service with an altar call. After the children have had an opportunity to come and to uh, respond to what God has been speaking to their heart, not what we've been speaking, but to what God has, has opened and shown them, um, we have a time of personal ministry. And that's where our prayer team uh, goes into action. Seven of the, the 100 and 120 prayer team members that we have will move uh, to the area that they pray in and will lay hands on children. Typically, by the time that is over with, parents have already come. Now, my favorite time is when they get here prior to us being complete with the personal ministry time because it's then when parents are able to see that children are laying hands on children and they are able to see that their children are laying hands on other children and the power of God is moving through them. They're able to see a young man with healing in his hands being used powerfully by God and now they're beginning to come in and line up to get prayed for by these undefiled vessels that God is using so powerfully. We couldn't found a better per person than Van Lane. He's been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, with our children and uh, God has come down in the children's church and, um, and works there and moves there just as powerfully as he does in the adult services. We cannot uh, minimize what God is doing with the children. It's pro prophesied. Peter said in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. God said, I'll, he, in quoting from Joel, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. We usually think of that as the young adults. No, no, he's talking about the little bitty children. When we uh, study the revivals of the past, for instance, the French prophets, the Huguenots, uh, they, they, the children were prophesying at three and four and five years old. And so this is nothing new. It's just God is, uh, is causing us to rediscover the old. It's nothing new. It's just we are tapping back into the old, to our roots where we needed to be all the time. I know that everybody thinks that these, the great revival is gonna come from their own department. But I believe that God is raising up a new generation of children that are going to release revival on the world. And when they do, it's going to consume what we know as the church. And it's going to draw people from everywhere into the kingdom. The TV department at the Brownsville Assembly of God has been used to help spread revival all over the world. Through their weekly TV show and numerous videos, many have come to the revival to experience this outpouring for themselves. It, the te television ministry began here at Brownsville in the spring of 1987. Um, I came in here as a consultant originally, uh, working as a uh, production manager at the local Christian television station, and I was one of several people that they called in to kind of get an idea of how they wanted to start off. And in the process of them putting together their first television program, they ran into some technical problems and uh, called me at home to come in and kind of bail them out. And that's the first time I'd met Pastor. And we kind of hit it off together and he asked me if I would come on part time to help them in the post-production of their television program. The crew that I have now has been a true blessing from the Lord and these have been godsend. Uh, they have literally, uh, you know, I've almost felt like Moses when he had Aaron and her holding up his arms. Uh, they came in just just at the right time, just in the nick of time I think, uh, because uh, revival's hard on people that are, uh, you know, people that are out there praying for revival, they need to be careful of what they're praying for 
if they all they want is all the the goosebumps and the golly gee whiz kind of stuff they need to count the calls behind the scenes too I've often told people uh, it's wonderful being here in Revival, but I'm paid to be here. I think uh, my reward is going to be somewhat less than the people that don't have to be here, but constantly give of themselves, give of their time and their talents and their abilities to be here and serve the Lord behind the scenes. We constantly hear from the pulpit um, people to say, you know, I, I was watching your Allison video or I was watching... Um, you know, a particular Steve Hill sermon or a John Kilpatrick sermon, or I was watching, now we're on uh, satellite in Europe and we're on satellite uh, throughout North America. And, uh, you know, someone that was watching the television program or someone that received a videotape, I think one of the most remarkable testimonies that I have heard personally was uh, from a young man who's now on our pastoral staff here uh, as one of our cell group pastors uh, who was on a ministry trip to Russia and was walking through Red Square and was stopped by someone and uh, through the interpreter that was there this man recognized him from seeing him on a Brownsville video. This man had received a copy of a copy of a copy. He was from Siberia, had received this video in Siberia, had given his heart to the Lord from watching this duplicated videotape and was now in Moscow in Red Square and saw this man from Brownsville walking through and recognized him and just stopped to hug his neck and tell him how much you know the service had meant to him and that he'd given his heart to the Lord and that that just blows me away and to realize that's just the tip of the iceberg that that testimony can probably be just related thousands of times over if pastor would give an altar call before revival I would have the person on camera three that's the camera on the platform turn the camera to the platform and take his hands off the camera so the people would realize that that camera was not going to be on them if they wanted to come forward. Uh, since Steve Hill has come and uh, his kind of in-your-face evangelistic preaching, I quickly realized that if a camera in somebody's face is going to keep them from coming to the altar, then they're probably not going to have much when they walk outside that church to take with them. You know, if they're going to let a, a camera uh, interfere with their decision to come to the Lord, then they're probably not going to have much uh, to keep them on the right track when they go out there. I realized um, through the impact of revival and when I began to hear the impact that it was having around the world, uh, you have this awesome sense of, uh, you know, I've explained it sometimes, you, you have the sense that God kind of took out his daytime or in years ago when he was planning this great outpouring uh, that he penciled me in to have me here directing the television ministry at Brownsville Assembly. And that is an awesome thought and it's a very humbling thought um, to realize that you're chosen. Um, you know, a lot of people go through life not thinking um, that God cares too much about them and uh, you know, we all suffer from those kind of thoughts. But to sit there and think that it wasn't just an accident that I was here or the camera people were here, some of the other people, the audio people, uh, all the people that, that work technically behind the scenes, but that we were actually chosen by God. At the same time, you know, there's another side to that coin uh, that the Lord has reminded me of very pointedly that even though God chose me, He doesn't need me. And I say that in the sense that if I allow coldness or sin or, or anything to come into my own heart, if I should uh, just take God's presence here for granted or take, take His choice of me for granted in this position, even though it's a great and wonderful position, God doesn't need me here and He can just as quickly remove me as He put me here. And, and so I constantly keep that in the back of my mind, that it's a, it's a great and awesome responsibility and, and a very humbling thought to have been chosen by the Lord for this position. But um, I don't doubt for a moment that if I would ever, ever um, get out of God's plans and purposes for my life or, or just get colder and different and just go off into sin and think I'm above 
uh, that because of God's touch on my life that, um, that He could remove me in a heartbeat, uh, literally in a heartbeat. I could be removed from this position and it wouldn't miss a beat. There wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't shut down the television ministry because I was gone. Uh, but the God's purposes and plans would continue on, with me or without me. Robert and Joanne Lowell are a very happy couple. They are on fire for God. But before coming to the Brownsville Revival, Joanne would spend hours before the Lord, interceding for her wayward husband and for her entire family. Before the revival touched our life and our family, people in our hometown thought that we were very successful. We both had successful businesses. We were in church on Sunday. We dressed the part of a successful couple. We drove nice cars. We had a beautiful home. And we did a lot of traveling. So we didn't let people get real close to know how we were really communicating, the two of us. But we, from the outside, looked very successful. Before God got a hold of me in Pensacola, no one knew that I was, uh, basically no one knew that I was an alcoholic. No one knew that I was, uh, pharmaceutical drugs uh, uh, inhibited me. I know that I would have to wake up with an upper in the morning uh, that a physician had given me. And uh, Joanne was not aware of it. And then in the uh, middle of the day, I'd have to have something else to keep going. And then when I drank vodka, I would also smoke uh, cigarettes. So, I, you know, I'd have to uh, get the breath mint to clear that out. But I would drink, uh, you know, straight vodka to bring me down. I heard about the revival through a newspaper article and had occasion to be in Mobile, Alabama on business, Mary Kay, Mary Kay business. And all of my appointments canceled for the following day, and so a friend and I took that time to, to travel down to Pensacola. And I'm thinking this is a little tent revival. I had no idea what I was in for. And went to the church, waited, went to the church, and uh, Lyndall Cooley began to sing. And the minute the music started, I knew that this was God. I knew it was the Lord. The sense of peace and God's love and just, um, his presence was so strong. I had not felt that since I'd been saved nearly 22, three years ago. So it was awesome. I, for the first time, had hope. Even thinking I would never go back, I would never have a chance to go back to revival, I knew that God was real, that He was here today, and that His presence was real. After the service, Joanne decided to call Robert and ask him to come to the revival. And surprisingly, he agreed to come. So in spite of a severe snowstorm and a power failure, Robert began to pack in the dark. As he went out to his car, he noticed that the storm was so bad that no one was even driving on the roads. Three state troopers tried to pull me over to tell me that the roads were closed and I just rolled down the window and said, hey, I can't stop. My wife is in Pensacola, Florida. I gotta go get her out of this radical move that's going on down there. It's a cult, so thank you very much. And, you know, I kept on driving, and I looked behind me, and the blue lights didn't come on, so I kept on driving. I had been sitting and saving seats for us all afternoon, second row from the front. And so when the service started, Robert came in and sat next to me. I can't tell you how I mean, he was so upset because here we are, almost in the front row, um, didn't want to be there. All I can think is, God, if this doesn't work, if you don't touch his life, if you don't touch our marriage, there's no hope for us. Immediately, uh, the atmosphere was so hot. I was so angry at her. I was so angry that I was cussing under my breath. I was mocking everything that was going on at that point to the point to where I looked over there and saw that she was crying and I thought, well, you know, okay, I guess I did what I was supposed to do. So I backed off of it a little bit. Steve Hill begins to preach, powerful sermon. Simon says, I'll never forget the words he preached. And I'm listening, trying to listen through Robert's ears, wondering how he's receiving this. And 
cold. I mean, his face was just blank. I can, you know, you can tell when a person's angry on the inside. Um, every time he would look at me, sarcasm, uh, flippant, it's like, you know, just blow this off. Um, he was not receiving a word of what Steve Hill was preaching. So after Steve Hill started, uh, uh, finished preaching, then uh, he asked Charity to, to come and sing the Mercy Seat song. So when that happened, she started singing that Mercy Seat song and it took everything that I uh, knew, every strength, every fiber of me, my being, to stay right there. And now my heart is sinking because I'm thinking to myself, God, if my husband doesn't go to the altar and get saved, if he can't get saved at, you know, when Steve Hill preaches here at Brownsville, there is no hope for us. There's no hope for this marriage. There's no hope for this man. And I'm really, uh, I mean, on the inside, I just feel like I, my emotions are being torn to shreds. I am a mess. I turned around, I looked at Joanne, I said, I guess you want us to go forward, right? And sarcastically, you know, and she was crying, she was still crying, and so I looked at her and I turned around and I thought, you know, okay, I'll, you know, I'll go forward, but, you know, I can stand it, we need business macho guy. So I grabbed her hand and I jerked her out into the aisle and we walked, started walking forward and I thought, oh, okay, this is good, I'll walk in front of this person that uh, is lying on the floor and that will be a barricade and the guy will come off the platform and they'll go to the left and right now, we won't have to get prayer and pastor comes down, comes directly to us, prays for Robert, begins to pray for my husband. And I'm standing there watching Robert get prayer by Pastor Kilpatrick. And I, I see this, just, I can just see this weight coming off of him, just this relaxing come off, and come off on his face. And, you know, you could see his countenance was beginning to change. It was like, I could feel this stuff uh, come off of me. And after Pastor prays for Robert, Pastor turns for me, and what I hear him say, because my eyes are closed, I hear him say to me, you know, God knows your heart, and you're a godly woman. And as he prays for me, I mean, I just melted. And I felt these strong arms catch me and lower me to the floor. And it was Robert catching me, and out of his mouth came bless her Lord in this awesome tone of voice, which it was just God. I turned around and looked to the left and Steve was coming around over on the left and then he touched me on the shoulder. And when he touched me on the shoulder, it was as though uh, a Mack truck hit me. I, it's the power of God out of his hand physically turned me around, physically, physically twirled me around and slammed me up against the wall like a Mack truck had ran over me. Later after the service, Robert had a lot to sort out. He was ready to go home and yet I was ready to stay. I wasn't, I wanted to be sure everything was okay. And so we ended up doing a lot of talking and ended up driving later that morning to the beach. And it was at the beach that he knelt down and began to repent before God and tell God how sorry he was for the way he had lived his life and the way he had treated me and the kids and really repented before God. And I think it was at that time that, that Jesus really became Lord and Savior of his life. He even showed me a six page, page divorce letter that he had written while he was in Pensacola. He was so uncertain of our relationship and where his life was headed but tore that letter up and just gave his whole heart to Jesus. And we left the beach that morning, arm in arm, totally forgiven, really restored 100%. I mean, God just did a very quick work in both of our hearts. And I drove back uh, with him to our home in Blairsville, Georgia. And things have never been the same since. I think the most important thing that's happened is our lives have been totally changed. You know, we have yeah. moved to Brownsville. Brownsville is our church now. And um, we're involved in ministry here. Um, I've resigned from my 
directorship with Mary Kay Cosmetics soon after Robert was saved, and I'm a wife and mother now again. I wouldn't, I, you know, I just would not be living right now. I would not be living right now. I would not have the peace and the joy that I have without the material things, without the money, without the, all of that. I don't care a hoot about that anymore. I care about the presence of God. In our family, we have a prayer room. We have a, uh, an office that is dedicated to the Lord. And I get to breathe. I get to see other people, other men that are out there that want the presence of God, but they don't know how to get it. It's not about how you act. It's about how you let Jesus into your heart. And that's what happened. I, I'm a broken man. I'm humble. And I know him personally. I know our Heavenly Father personally. So it's, it's radically changed my life. And I, I owe it all to the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. Life used to be so complicated. It seems simple now. Living in God's presence, being touched by His power, that's changed everything. Our thinking's not the same. Our priorities have changed. We don't live for ourselves anymore. We live for God. We want to please Him. We fell in love with Jesus, and now that love just spills over for each other, our family, people in our lives, people we don't even know. God's restored our marriage. He's touched our children. He's given our entire family a fresh start. God answered my prayers. He set us both so free. I mean, we've just gotten so saved. We say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We can't say it enough. We're so grateful.